Um, my name is Onno Ebbingen. I work for the Dutch government data center, Region North. Uh, we manage hundreds of physical servers and thousands of virtual servers. Uh, we're growing fast in the hosting of Dutch government agencies and departments in our cloud. We also offer massive amount of storage running in the several petabytes. Um, the storage is already multi-region and soon our cloud will be also multi-region over several data centers. Um, I'm here to share with you how we uh, deploy and manage all these servers at scale with a small team. And I wouldn't be standing here if SALT did not play a major role in all of this. So basically, this is my agenda. Um, what we do with SALT, it gives some context of our problems and our uh, uh, challenges. Uh, the title of my uh, talk, our challenge, um, small overview of what we're trying to do, and our solutions, prepare, deploy, operate. It was a major vendor who had something similar. Um, what we do with Facet, we have several departments. Uh, one is Facet, the other one is Duo, and of course where I'm working for, it's the Dutch government data center, Region North. That's in Dutch, by the way. It's, uh, so, uh, Facet is a, a nationwide digital assessment and examination system. And we, the, the, the special takeaway with this is that we have an on-premise part and an off-premise part. I won't talk about the on-premise, there's a few hundred minions there, and, but it's standard sold. The off-premise part is we have a downloadable ISO, so the educational institute can download it, and uh, we don't even know where they're running it on. It's physical or virtual or where or how they are configured, but they phone home, so they connect over the internet to our data center, and so we can manage them. We're last week, or two weeks ago, we passed 1,000 minions. We will scale up to 1,800 in phase one. Phase two will be between five and 8,000 minions running that way. So that's a special case. And to give you an idea of the scale of all three departments, um, if you look at the population of the Netherlands and the economic uh, uh, growth, uh, it's comparable to Florida, so and you know at scale we're running on. Um, the other department is Duo, um, basic standard salt operation. Uh, the unique thing of Duo is a colleague of mine, Sebastian Glazenborg. He made a salt meta state system driven purely by pillar data, so he has a few 10 or 12 uh, states. They're completely generic, and so he defines various packages. I, I hope he will do a presentation about this because I'm not gonna explain it, it takes way too long, but that's the special case here. And of course, our uh, data center, the government data center, uh, we're one of the four pairs, um, and we're the one who are starting to do uh, housing instead of co-location. The original setup was co-location, but co-location will decline and they want housing as the cloud. Uh, they don't want to be bothered with uh, physical uh, stuff anymore. Um, the takeaway is that SALT plays a central role in our deployment and operations. And we do open source wherever and whenever we can. And that's not only a cost thing, it's also a control thing. So, yeah. That's our philosophy. Um, this is what we're, uh, where our team is focusing on, is on the hosting. So we do storage and cloud on, on, on large scale. Let's start with the storage, because you have always to solve the storage problem before you solve anything else. Um, we have quite a lot of storage. Um, we have like one petabyte raw on SSD, uh, we have uh, several seven, eight petabyte uh, SATA storage. Um, they're all physical uh, machines. And um, yeah, the takeaway here is SALT deploys and manages all of this. And um, it scales very well. 
And if you solve the storage problem, the rest is easy. <clears throat> okay, we have also an, an, an OpenStack cloud. Um, there was a vendor we worked with. They did two installations with us. And we think we can do better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know how to explain it in another way. Um, so after two deployments, uh, we thought, fun, well, doing better would be easy. And uh, so we started with Salt, trying to deploy OpenStack. And we are now at a level that it runs in pre-flight. And so we're basically uh, uh, testing how we can go from pre-flight to production. So we're very far with our salt deployments in our cloud. And the base of our uh, operations, that's uh, true for Ceph and OpenStack and other stuff, is that the whole CMDB targeting stuff I'm talking here about. So that's the key thing I'm talking about. So our challenge, herding lots of cattle. So how can we deploy a large number of servers fast? Physical, virtual, cloud, doesn't matter. You have a lot of them and you want to deploy fast. Easy. You want to not have pets. You want to assign roles or profiles. And you want to do this across several data centers. So it must be easy. I want to walk in with a hard disk, plug it in, and deploy the whole data center. It's for disaster recovery. It's for the time it takes to get things up and running. It, it, it works for everything. Um, and the main thing, how can we scale out instead of scale up? And it, yeah, how you can control all this madness? Because we want to do, yeah, large stuff. This is a familiar slide. I almost copied it 100% from uh, Gavin McCain at CERN. Uh, you, hear, you hear this a lot, so I will not explain it. But most people forget the third point he was making because you should use cattle, but you always have pets around. You will not escape that. And I, I added fast redeployment, but he says you, it's okay to have pets as long as you have strong configuration management. And I add it should be fast redeployable because weird stuff happens and you need it back. And pets are, more, are hurting more than cattle when they disappear and they all disappear somehow, sometime. <laughs> it's really weird sometimes. You don't know what happens. So we want to spin up a new one really fast. And it's like, if you have pets, you take them DNA and just clone them, like Dolly, and not waiting 18 years for they grow up, but instantly. Let's talk about major considerations and standardization. Um, we thought about it a lot. And it's very important, but we can do better because often standardization is a means to an end and not an end in itself. And a lot of people use this as a barrier for um, innovation, uh, doing new stuff. So we put some other considerations before that. And of course, if you apply this, standardization stuff will roll out. But as I said, as a an means and not as an end. So we want to have simplicity, automation, and adaption. The last one is also an embrace of change. Um, you really have to keep up because the longer you wait, the harder it will be to upgrade, etc. So our cloud is running a very current version. And we go through lots of pain to update it every half year. And SALT is really helping in that because we can do it fast. And we can do it consistently. And yeah, if you're updating and you think, yeah, we're ready. And then there's the other data center. It needs to be done also. So you don't have a lot of time. It must be snappy. I have made a list of all our considerations over the last years. I went through emails, notes, whatever. This is about our list. But more important, it's a mindset. And um, you really have to think web scale. So 
leave the, the enterprise scale-up mindset and enter the web scale, scale-out mindset. And uh, at the bottom, exception is the rule, there is always that one server that's configured differently than the rest. So you need, your method needs to take that in account. It should not be that you do that by hand. It's not done. So um, whatever method you choose, the exception is the rule. And it basically, for the mindset, it is very important that in the old world, scaling up, you have a decreasing return to scale. So if your input is, is, is uh, uh, 20, you get a good yield, but if you scale up to 100, yeah, your output will decrease dramatically. It, this will hit a wall very fast. This is what enterprises try to do, a constant return to scale, and most of the time they end up somewhere between. So that's good. And these are the unicorns, these are the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, CERN. They really need increasing returns to scale, otherwise it won't work. So this is, if, if you can hold that line, you will act like Google. But here's a reality check, we will never be as big as Google, and we will never be as big as CERN. But if you pretend to be, you can reap the benefits. So it's all about mindset. I hope I bored you enough. <laughs> yeah, so let's get on with it. How do we solve that? We try to uh, keep things simple. So we have a three uh, uh, step from uh, empty box or non-existent virtual machine to fully operational applied role and it's uh, running production. Uh, it has some prerequisites. Of course, the bare metal must be available or the hypervisor or the cloud, otherwise you cannot deploy. Uh, some basic services. Uh, we also been bootstrapping in data centers, so these are a pain in the air. <coughs> this is on camera, right? Yeah, so um, if you have these in pl uh, place and this is a very small set of prerequisites, you can uh, uh, go ahead and, and uh, deploy. This is the basic three-step overview. So this is a helicopter overview. Um, you make a CMDB. You have an ISO image. That's that one you won't touch often. You have a kickstart or cloud in. You won't touch often either. Uh, you have a deploy step and you have an operate step. And basically, you want to have uh, as little data as possible and have the highest yield at the end of the whole chain. So this is looks a, a schematic, the three steps, prepare, deploy, operate. Uh, the CMDB at the top, part of my title, um, OS, kickstart, comes all together. Via Gobbler, we do the whole deploy stuff. And here, salt comes in. And the main thing you take away here is that salt is part of our deployment also instead of operations. So we want to keep things simple at the beginning. So the ISO is almost not touched. The only thing we touch on the ISO is the versioning and we put a minion on it. And that's it. I will show you later. It's the same with the Kickstart. We do nothing fancy in the Kickstart. We don't configure anything. Keep it simple. It updates very fast if you keep things simple. So we want to have salt do the heavy lifting. So we use salt in our deployment phase. And later on, of course, the same salt <laughs> we use for the operations. So that's the key takeaway. This is the bare metal KVM deployment, and we have a separate cloud deployment. And as you see, I flip uh, forward and backwards. As you see, the main goal is to get the salt minion running. It, it can be pluggable if you have an other system than Cobbler or whatever. It doesn't matter. Don't do anything beforehand. Just get it deployed. Get the minion running. He will do your work. So this is a little bit high over uh, and a little bit scarce on details. So I will go into details now. 
basically, the CMDB, and this is an embarrassing slide. <clears throat> so we have configuration items. Um, the API, preferably a, a, a modern REST with JSON. Uh, Two-way sync. I don't like working in a CMDB, so I like to edit the files by hand. And so I want a two-way sync in this one. <laughs> so I can do stuff on the disk and the guys in the CMDB see that. And if they change something in the CMDB, I will see that on the files. But we failed to connect to our CMDB. Uh, the, the HTTP request interface was very crude. I could not even find the name of it, how they do it. It's highly insecure. Uh, it went to penetration testing and almost failed by looking at it. <laughs> it's really horrible. I, I, I'm sorry. I won't name the product after, after the present. No. Uh, the, it is 15 years old, and all the CMDBs are low innovation products. They're all boring. So I have a boring talk. No. Um, now what? So basically we will be developing, and I'm in the midst of this one, a CMDB light with all the modern stuff on it. And we have cron to export the file because I want them in the old CMDB. Our help desk is working uh, with the CMDB. Our reporting system is working with the CMDB. So I will be importing that through a file. So I will SSH it to the server and then Okay, for now, we will use YAML. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh, less than ideal, but it, it presents better, so <laughs> you can see them on the next slides. The preparation step, as I said with the ISO image, do as little as possible. Uh, we update the packages. It's a single line of code to update the packages on the ISO image. Adding the salt minion is a single line of code. You have to recreate the repo data. That's it. With the kickstart also, you have to format the disk, install the packages, activate the network, otherwise the minion will not connect. DNS, NTP, reboot, and let salt take over. Simple. So the first phase, uh, we, we do that with Gobbler, but it's pluggable, so you don't need to do it with Gobbler. If you have something else, uh, that's fine. Uh, but you have to define an environment. So I have here two examples for bare metal and a an hypervisor guest. And as you can see, the hypervisor guest is only extra information because it needs to know uh, the uh, operating system variant and the CPU type and where the, the, the console goes and how it boots. Uh, so, and, and this is a, a production example. This is real production. So this is all it needs uh, for its environment. Also for the first phase, you want to define the server. And again, this is a full production example. We have one for bare metal and one for the hypervisor guest. Uh, the bare metal is uh, always complex about the interfaces. I chose this one because it's a little bit simpler. Um, but we have uh, several bonds, IPv4, IPv6, mix, uh, VLANs, whatever. It can handle it all. Uh, the hypervisor example is, uh, of course, simpler. And I need to define the CPUs and the memory, of course, and some standard stuff. It, it, it really works great. As you can see, by the way, this is our IPv6 only data center. And SALT works perfectly in an environment IPv6 only. And if you're really interested in how, what problems you have with IPv6 in a data center, you should talk uh, after this uh, talk to me. So this is the first phase. So basically you need an environment, a server config, and you're ready to go. We try to keep this as simple as possible. Um, the salt part, you, you see some duplication here, so it will not be duplicated in, in the CMDB, of course, because you export uh, these information. Uh, but salt needs this information, and we put it in a file. And how this file appears, I will explain later. Uh, the takeaway here is this is just our environment settings. So you define the stack, 
DNS, NTP, the master, repos, and our monitoring system. Again, a real full production example. It all fits on slides, so uh, that way we can keep it simple and really scale. The server definition uh, is even simpler, um, and we're very happy with this because you say this server belongs to this environment, so it uh, uh, gets all the information, and, and it should be applied with these roles. There's some magic there, I will explain later. But the ID to take away here is it's that simple to make a server CI. This is a summary. Uh, you define the server in Gobbler, you define the server in Salt, and you're ready to go. You have your environment set up, you do it not very often because, yeah, how many environments do you have? But a number of servers, this is mostly what you do. So, prepare, deploy, operate. The deploy part is really the fun part because basically you just reboot the whole thing. Um, we have some, some basic scripting uh, to, uh, uh, to get our IPMI to reboot. It's just a loop and uh, it says reboot and then it will boot off the cobbler server. Uh, for KVM, we had to do some customization uh, to do a batch virtual install. Uh, the cool thing here is not salt related, but it boots right off the uh, repository. It's supported, to my surprise, in, in QAMI that it can boot from a repository. And of course, it's, if it's a cloud uh, machine, we use salt cloud. But the takeaway here is, as you see, there are different types of machines and it's the same method. So again, keeping things simple so it will scale easily. So, now we're, uh, we have deployed the whole thing, it reboots, the minion comes up, and now what? Because that was a small configuration of the server. And then we hit a wall. So these are the problems we have, I'm sorry, management talk, the challenges we have <laughs> with our pillar and our states. So basically, how do you scale top SLS? It will really get a mess. I hope I'm resonating here because that was our problem. It needs to be resilient because an error in top SLS in, in YAML is easy to do and it will break the whole thing. Uh, and we want to keep the security because pillar was made for a reason and we don't want to give this up. A lot of people use grains for all kinds of stuff and the whole security thing of the pillar breaks down when you use that, so don't do that. <laughs> um, you have a chicken egg problem if you define a role. So I said in a pillar file, need these roles. And yeah, you want to add extra information to that, but it's not possible uh, in a normal way. So basically you want to compound data, so you have the server information, add the environment information, and add all the role information. And it comes in a little bit less problem, uh, problematic uh, back in the state. How do I scale the top? How do I apply the roles? And, and, and in what order? Pillar targeting. It, we, we hit a wall. Um, and we were really having trouble with our top S lessons. We tried several things, but this one is the best. And I tried to Google a funny picture with this one. <laughs> don't do that. It, it, no, don't do it. So I keep it like this and you, whatever. <laughs> or automate the pillar top as less away. That was the original title of this slide. <laughs> so our production top as less for the pillar is this. And that's all. We, we don't touch it anymore. We don't use grains. So you can see there is some YAML over here and it splits up the minion ID 
in the host name and domain name. And we have a directory in the pillar uh, structure and it just has a domain name as a subdirectory, so we, our different environments are split up. So you have some overview. Uh, and then you have a host name. So you can use more host names, not a problem. Um, and you can adapt to this, to your environment, whatever you want, no problem. And you can do nice stuff here. But don't use grains. They will break down your security model. If you do it like this, you keep the security, you easily scale. So, recap. How uh, did our server look like? It looked like this. Easy and simple. So, now I have to compound or stack the data. And I didn't know how to do that. And I was just lurking the user email, uh, as, as sometimes I do. And this guy, thank you, Bruno. Cheers to you as well, because you had a good solution. And it got merged in standard salt. I think the latest version of 2015-8, it got merged in. But we had an older one. So, But you can copy this file and in, in the pillar directory and just use it. You can go as low as 2014 something, I remember. But you can just drop it in the directory. It's default sold now because it's been merged. So no magic here, default sold, and it works great. And I will talk you through it because this is the magic. Basically, you define an X pillar. Well, that wasn't too hard. And this is, again, a full production example because now I have a way of adding the environment and role files and merge them with the other pillar. I don't have heaps of code. This is it. And again, it's easy, customizable for your use case. You don't have to use my code. Hey, you're allowed to, but you don't. So you have some different use case, you can just change it, no problem. Okay, um, to give you an example, what, what, what this does, normally if a pillar gets rendered, then the X pillar gets called, and it works like this, so all the code gone, in, nothing there. So the pillar, as you saw, our top file will get the host name. Does this work? Yeah, it works. Okay, so the top file uh, uh, gets the host name, and that's standard pillar. And now we added pillar stack, so it will merge the environment you saw earlier. It will merge the role in a generic way. And yeah, you have per environment, of course, needs for that role. I first had only this one, but this one get added very quickly. Uh, and here, and this is the trick, Exception is the rule. In the end, if you have a minion that needs to override any data before it, no problem. You, you, you cannot only merge, but you can override data. Easy. So exception is the rule. This model works even if you have spoiled pets. <laughs> Pillar stack in action. And I, again, recap, this was our server file. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is a Ceph OSD node. So it's a simple Ceph node, one of 180 we have. Um, I chose this one because of its simplicity, but you can see it in action. So this is the normal pillar file. Then the environment comes along. You've seen this one. This is an RCMDB. So, this environment gets rendered, so now the pillar knows how to get, uh, how the uh, minion knows how to get it sold. Uh, the OS knows where its repo is. You even see the version as specified uh, earlier on. Uh, we have a Zabbix server, our monitoring. This is the first role. Uh, it, it does a lot more, but it doesn't need data. 
the only data it needs our base uh, uh, state. It needs the repositories, of course. Uh, but it's also a very nice example uh, because this could be easily accumulated with extra repositories. So this is our base role. This is our Zebix agent role. And as you, as you can see, it will add this repository. In the past, we just specified the 20 repositories we have. Security was thrilled by it. Now we have a better model. We just add them by the role. Uh, and we, ha we add extra generic Zabbix uh, 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 stuff. So it belongs to a Ceph cluster, and it has different uh, machines. But this is just generic Ceph. So it has a Ceph repository. It has a, di a different version, so I overrided the version. It needs to know in what environment. So this is the generic role, and this is the role in this environment. So it knows, it needs to know the serial number of our cluster, and it needs to know the monitors. This is how Ceph works, so don't bother. But it's very environment specific. OK, uh, here is the. Uh, Ceph OSD specific stuff, so the Ceph common was the other slide. Uh, and a Ceph OSD has some extra Zabbix parameters and it will be merged with the generic ones. Uh, and again, uh, this role has environment specific settings and it, this is a key, of course not this key, but it, it, this is the key it needs to bootstrap this node. So the cluster will accept it as a data storage node. So this, and I, I don't have this on the slide because it's too much, but this will merge into one pillar data. So if you do a, a, a salt a pillar items, you see one list, fully merged data. And this is ideal. I'll have all the data in a pillar and it will get pushed to a minion. No grains involved, uh, involved no funny stuff in the deployment uh, things, no copying files, whatever solutions everybody had thought of. <laughs> there are a lot of them. And let's go to the state targeting, because that top is also a problem. You feel them coming, right? Yeah, <laughs> this, uh, the fun is out of this one. But <laughs> you feel this one coming. Uh, we do this topless as well, otherwise it won't scale. And again, it fits easily on a sheet. It's simple, it just loops over the roles and applies the roles, nothing else. If you have another use case, it's easily adaptable to your use case. Again, an easy takeaway. You don't have to do stuff as we do, but hey. Um, recall again. Otherwise, I would be slipping flights, slides uh, uh, forwards and backwards, um, as I did in uh, testing. <laughs> you should not do that. It was nice feedback. Um, again, this is what the server looked like, the environments. And, and now you can see here the for loop. Ah, I should use the pointer. So you can hear, see here the for loop. It loops over the roles. And here, it just applies these roles. And I won't go too into the details of these states, but this is our directory. I've, of course, made it shorter so it fits on the sheet. But as you can see, these are all roles, and they will automatically be applied. I don't have to think about them. And, and that's easy, because if you recall, I will just to add an other CI in my CMDB and not think about it. And of course, I dream up a role. It doesn't exist. I have to develop it. But hey, I put it in a directory, and you can pick it up. Uh, another important thing is order of the roles. It's preserved. So you saw the for loop. Uh, sometimes you need to apply role in order. Sometimes you don't. But hey, you get it for free, uh, and you can use it. And order within. The state role is preserved. 
Again, I will have a small example, uh, again, simplified. So um, this is the row, and it has an init as less file, as you all know. And we just include stuff. Uh, so we break down a role in smaller files. Uh, as you can see, this is a base role, and we have a resolve, we have a repo manage, a firewall, some entropy we were missing, SSH, and hey, we have a physical server here, and we want smart mon tools, needless in virtual ones. So you can put all Jinja all over the place to make it intelligent, and it will honor it, and it will work. It's, it, yeah. So, there's some room in question and answering. How many? Oh, I did not bad. Um, if you want to have a demo, please uh, talk to me after the talk. Um, you can ask some question and answer, and I'll have, I'll have some time. I have some giveaway. It, it, I don't have a slide of it, but we try to work with the backup this way because a backup restore takes very long and physical servers change over time. And if you have a pet, you want to try to restore the server and it has a different chipset. Wow, that works well. <laughs> so if you can redeploy really fast, you don't have to do block level backups anymore, just state. And we have um, a simple uh, um, Boolean. So if we deploy a role, it will be a new server or it needs to restore state and we give it an, a URL so it can find its state on our S3 storage nodes. So the backup, we can, re we, we can restore backups really, really fast. And normally, if you do old backups the old way, um, you have to test them every month, which we all do, yeah? But non-tested backups are no backups. We've all seen this one before. The tape is faulty, the file is gone. There is some stack trace in, in the middle of the backup script. Y you name it, we've seen it all. And so you want to test them, but you don't always have the time. But if you use your deployment for restorement, you deploy often. You always test that. So your backup is tested. You just need to check your S3 if the backup is there. You don't have to test your redeployment. You did that yesterday. And it's easy to do a, a, a test in, 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 in your pre-flight or in your development because, hey, give them the URL and you test your deployment and just restore. For security, it's great because if you had a breach, you don't know which backup has been infected or not. It's a pain. You have to search for all your backups. Sometimes you have to restore them all just to find out if it's infected or not. It's really difficult. And so if you just redeploy it, you know there is no stuff on it because it's fresh. And restore the data, of course, it should not be in the data, but hey, um, but it's, it's easier. So we use it for other purposes as well. Okay, guys, I'm sorry uh, to add this, this one because I, I left it out because I thought I would run out of time. The question and answer uh, uh, session. Any questions? I saw some fingers. Yeah, you? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this guy is asking for if we're doing orchestration. We're doing a little bit orchestration. Um, and um, not as much as I like to, so we're in the process of doing that. And it will work in this way. And I talked to Thomas about this problem because then you have two entry points, your orchestration and your high state, and you don't want two entry points. So, we're trying to figure out, just as your use case, on one entry point, just orchestrate. And if it's not part of a cluster, just run the high state. So we, we're, we're not sure of this one. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm making a long stretch here, but we basically want to get rid of the two entry points. So leave the high state aside and only salt run orchestrate. And if the orchestrate sees it's not part of a cluster, just do the high state. Does this answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? You had some question? No? Answer that one. In the back? I, I was just going to make a comment earlier about the uh, backups. Once uh, 16 petabytes, uh, once the uh, uh, backups that were uh, being corrupted as they went into the backup system, and then a uh, while later, uh, the people that got into the system that were silent and corrupted the backups, they crashed the whole entire environment. And because the backups weren't corrupted, it was just. Yeah. So. Uh, this, this, this. Um, I, I made a comment that that you have problems with restoring backups, and he, uh, this guy had his same use case. And I, I, I think that our deployment can really help you in this case, because you re deploy a fresh server. You only concerned about the data, and and you don't need as much storage. Normally, you have like a petabyte of SSD uh, running with all virtual machines, and you need another petabyte for the block level backup. It's way too much and way too expensive. And if you do only state, you're surprised how it's like 95 data, 95% uh, of stuff you don't need. So it, it is faster, it's way cheaper, uh, it's more secure. Ah. Other remarks, questions? It was really that simple? Oh, sorry. Yeah. We want to put it uh, all in the open. Uh, I work for the Dutch government. Uh, we're trying to figure out a license. Uh, after a long search, uh, I, I hope the license will look like the open government license the UK is using. It looks like a lot alike an MIT-based license, so it's very liberal. Uh, we're going through a process on that one, and then we will all put it on GitHub, even our cobbler salt integration. It's in all the code we have. We want to be as transparent as possible. Uh, and maybe you guys can dream up of even better stuff than we did. So, or polish it. So we're in, in the process of that. Yeah. I hope that is fast, but the lawyers are not that fast. <laughs> I'm sorry. They're really slow. Other remarks, questions? So, this was the last presentation of you all, you guys.